I'm going to turn it over to you. We're excited to learn about fishing with you. Yay, thank you so much. And uh, welcome everybody. Um, and thank you very much, Shannon, for the intro. Um, but yes, I am in Charleston, South Carolina, and I have been um, fishing my whole life. <laughs> but I have been in the business of aquatic education um, for a little over, well, around 22 years now. So um, I, I tell people I'm an expert at beginning fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an expert in fishing per se, but I can, I, uh, I'm very good at teaching folks and being patient and, and helping folks really understand what makes it work because I have had so much experience in my own childhood and then um, growing up and, and doing programs for women and for families and for children. So yeah, I'm happy to have everybody. So I'm going to gear this to, um, as to a basic level and I, I told Shannon I was gonna ask a few questions and put it in the, get y'all to respond in the chat box so that's why one of the things she was gonna help help do was was take a look at that and make sure everybody could use that so if you have been fishing ever um, I want you to to say me or whatever just type it in the chat box so that I know um, how kind of get an idea of how many people have ever been fishing before ever in their whole life all right, we've got Sharon raising her hand. Uh, Sarah says she has Kendall, Pat. It looks like we have mostly people who have some experience with fishing. Okay. There are probably some people out there like me who have been fishing, but it was years ago. So I have a lot <laughs> to learn today. So before you hop, hop off, I'm gonna do a, how many of you have been fishing in the past year? If you've been fishing in the past year, do a hand wave or say me or whatever. We've got one hand raised. All right. Two hand raises. <laughs> All right. Good. So there's, so there's a couple people. So some people have been fishing before. Some people have been fishing in the past year. How many people have been fishing in the past month? That's Anyone? Good. I think Sarah Green has. <laughs> Oh, okay. So the last two months. So we've got two. Good. Yeah. Um, and one of the things is that probably some of you have noticed that um, there's been an uptick if you've got, tried to go and buy tackle um, lately since COVID hit. Um, sometimes it's hard to find it. So um, as as people have been um, trying to deal with the, this this pandemic situation, a lot of people have been turning to the outdoors and we're seeing gear um, at a, at a, just flying off the shelves. So um, I ha we have noticed a lot more license sales, a lot more equipment has been um, purchased. And so there's a need for people to really learn and know the basics. So, so what I'm gonna teach today um, is really the basics, under understanding the rod. I'm gonna talk about a spin cast rod. I'll show you a spinning rod as well, um, but I encourage you, I'm going to go through this, and of course, if you have questions, put in the chat box, but if it's something that you want more detailed information on, or, or you want to just chat with me personally later on for something more advanced than what we're doing here today, I encourage you to just get on one of my social media pages, um, Angling Women on Facebook or Instagram, and send me a message, and I will be happy to, to work with you and get you where you need to be. So, that being said, we're going to start with the hardest part. Um, well, before I do that, I'm going to show you those combos I mentioned. So this, this is a spin cast combo, and this is the one that I'll be teaching you on today. So when you hold this, you hold it with the reel on top and you reel this way. Um, and a lot of, a lot of people start out with those when they're first fishing. Um, and then this is a spinning rod. This is my, um, the one that I use most of the time. Um, and this one, when you're fishing with a spinning rod, the, the reel goes on the bottom, it hangs down below. <clears throat> so there are some differences with different types of combos. Um, I can get into this later, but um, most of the combos when you go to buy something, so again, this one, you, you hold on top when you're reeling, but all the information is written on the reel. And then there's also information written on the inside of the rod right here that tells you 
um, of information about how much line to put on there, how much weight it can do, what the action of, of it is. So there's, there's a lot of information you can find on the equipment itself. Um, and the, the Cabela's and Bass Pro Shops um, are great places to go. They've got knowledgeable people that can help you. Um, if you can't get to one of those, if you go to your local tackle shop, a lot of times those folks are really helpful in getting you started and getting you um, with the right equipment to match what you're going after. Um, so today we're going to do um, how to rig your rod and get ready to go for basic fishing. So we're going to do a basic float rig. And like I said, we're going to start with the hardest part, which is knot tying. So make sure you grab your, your rope or um, I think Pat's got yarn. So I think, I think the white's going to show up better. Um, so what I'm going to do, um, if Shannon is going to, is okay with this, is I'm going to go through and teach the knot. And then after I go through and do the demo, I'm going to have her put up a graphic of, if, if she can, of how to, to tie that knot and give y'all a second to do that. And, and then we'll do it. We can do it together if you want. Um, yep, I'll get that pulled up when you're okay. ready for it. Thank you. Um, I will do the improved clinch knot first. Um, and so, so I'm going to use the white rope because I think it shows up better in here. I wasn't sure if the blue would do better. So this is my hook that I'm going to use. And this is an actual hook. I, it's more for catching your attention than anything else, but it is an actual 20 out shark hook. I don't want to see the shark that you catch with this. Um, but this, this is what I'll use. Um, so you can use, like I said, a binder clip, key ring, um, eye bolt, anything like that. So I'm going to show you, this is the knot that I grew up fishing with. So I'm going to go through the eye of the hook. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap. This would be the line that's attached to your fishing rod. So I'm going to wrap it around that line six times. Now, depending on the thickness of your fishing line, if you've got really thick fishing line, sometimes it doesn't take that many wraps. If you've got um, really fine fishing line, sometimes they'll take more wraps, but our rule of thumb and what we were told as children was to do it six times. So once we get it six times around, then I'm going to take this tag end and then there's a loop right here by the eyeball. I'm going to go through that loop right there. Okay. So when I, when I bring it through, if I tighten it down there, that would be the clinch knot, but we're going to do the improved clinch knot. So I'm going to go back through that big loop that I just made. Okay. So it's going to look all jumbly. And a lot of times with your yarn or your string, it won't slide like this, but when you're using fishing line or monofilament, you'll moisten it. That's not the COVID friendly part. You don't want to do that. But so uh, a lot of people just lick the line, but you can dab your tongue and, and slide on there and then tighten it down with your fingers. So it's going to stack all the way down right there. And so this is what that knot looks like once you get it tied. This tag end, you're going to leave about a quarter of an inch. And then one of the best tools I keep in my tackle box is clippers. I would use the clippers and cut that off about right there. Okay. So I'm going to do it one more time on video with everybody. Um, so if you've tied it and you want to untie it or clip it and start over, we'll do it together one more time and then I'll let, I'll get the graphic put up so everybody can see it. And at the end, um, there will be a link to a page that you can go and see knots. You can always just Google search the knots and watch the video I like the animated ones, but there are also flat photos of how to do it. Okay. Everybody ready? We're going to do this one again. Um, and again, so this is the improved clinch knot and you can, like I said, Google it. Um, Animated Knots by Grog is one of the websites that has the motion ones. Um, so here we go. I'm going to go through the eye and then I'm going to wrap it around the line that's attached to the fishing rod or to the reel six times. So spin, spin, spin. If, if you don't want to wrap it that way, you can actually spin the hook. So you'll do it six times and then you see that loop there again. Okay. So I'm going to go through that loop. 
Okay, I've got that. And then I'm gonna come back through that big loop. Okay, and I like to say, give yourself plenty. Again, that's where you would lick it if you have monofilament and then slide it down. You can use your, your nail. If you're using fishing line, a lot of times if you stack it down there with your nail, it does better. Um, so that's, and this is a very strong knot. Um, it will hold. And the reason why we do that, um, and Shannon, you can go ahead and, if you have the graphic ready, can you go ahead and stick that up? And I'll keep running my mouth. Um, <laughs> but um, there we go. So, so one of the reasons that we have to use a special knot is, especially with fishing line, if you just do 27 granny knots, it's going to slip and you get a big fish on there and then you're going to be sad because not only are you going to lose the fish, you're going to lose the hook and whatever else you tied on there. So uh, it's very, this is, like I said, this is one of the hardest things to learn in fishing, but once you get this, it's smooth sailing. So, so between the two knots that I'll teach you today, you, you'll probably pick a favorite and at the end of the webinar, I'm going to ask you which one you liked better. <laughs> I'm always curious to find that out. Um, but like I said, both of these are very strong knots. When you're fishing with monofilament, there's a little give in it, a little bounce. That's why you want to leave a quarter inch or a little bit of tag because it will slide. Um, the next knot that I'm going to show you is actually, if given the two knots, it tests a little stronger than the improved clinch knots, but both of these are really good to get started on basic fishing. So you're free to use whichever you'd like. All right, how are we doing? If you've, uh, if you've gotten your knot, if you've gotten it figured out, um, give me a little thumbs up in the chat box if you've gotten it. And some of you may know this. Some of you may use another knot. I sometimes use a loop knot. All right, got it. Um, different knots. Raise different from ones. Sharon. What's that? We've got a hand raise from Sharon. Pat's got it. I managed to do it too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Woo <-hoo. laughs> okay. So um. So that. Like I said, that one is, is very good, very strong. And once you get it, you can do it really quickly. It's really good if you're doing something complicated, if you've got a fancy rig or if you've got a lure with treble hooks, this one's good. That one's good to do with that. Um, the next one is better for like a single hook or a swivel or some, some simple thing because you have to, it has a loop involved in it. So you'll see this. Um, okay. And I will tell you this. The next one, like I said, I grew up fishing with the improved clinch knot. The next knot is called the Palomar knot. And it is, like I said, a, a little bit stronger than the improved clinch knot, but both very good fishing knots. Okay, so I'm going to show you. I'm going to just kind of do it quickly and show you, and then I'll do it slowly. We'll do it, let you follow me, and then I'll put up the graphic again. Okay, so this one, again, it's attached to the fishing rod. I'm going to come through the eye, and I'm going to turn it back around and go back through. Not over and back through, but I'm going to turn it back around and go back so that I have a loop, okay? For this knot, I give myself lots to work with, so, so plenty of line to work with. Um, and then I'm going to do what's called a half hitch. I call it a granny knot. It's the knot that you tie in your shoelace before you do the bow. So it's basically over and under. So I'm going to cross this over and put it through. And so that's where you would kind of tighten it down to tighten your shoe, but we don't tighten it down there. Um, all we do is take the knot and put it through that loop and tighten it down. And that's it. So like, I'll make sure that kind of slides off of there. And that's it. Then you would tap, you would uh, cut off the tag end here. Okay, so there's gonna be a little more um, to, to cut off there. But this one, once you get this knot, I think this one is um, pretty simple, but some people have trouble with getting that half hitch to work because you're, you're treating the loop and the two ends like it's one piece. So sometimes it's a little tricky for folks, but I'm gonna do it again slowly and get y'all to follow and do it with me. And some of you may have already gotten it again. All right, 
Well, it's a really good knot because I can't get it out. <laughs> All right, here we go. Sorry about that. Okay. So here we go. There's the, there's the line coming off the fishing reel. So I'm going to go through the eye. I'm going to pull a lot through. Another fishing rod. I'm going to go back through that eye. So here's, here's what I have. Lots to work with. I have a loop and I have the two that the one that's attached to my fishing rod and the tag in and I'm holding those together and I'm going to go over that and under. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Over and under, just like your granny knot in your shoe. Okay, so here's my loop. And I just put the hook or your keychain or whatever you're tying through there. And I'm gonna get that over the edge and slide it down. That's it. Okay. So then it would be attached to the fishing rod. I would cut that tag in again about, give it about a quarter of an inch and I'll give it some room to, to play and slide and that's your knot. All right, it, um, do you mind sticking that graphic up for the Palomar knot? All right. Um, again, anytime you're, you're using monofilament, um, Moisture is going to help it help the line slide a lot better. So if you can, if you have a drink or something because you don't want to lick it, you could just like grab the sweat off your drink uh, condensation and and dab it or uh, lick it. A, a long time ago, they used to make candy called spit and hit candy, and <laughs> it would make your mouth kind of water. So um, and they always made it in watermelon flavor because that was what the fish liked. So um, they would say, the directions on the candy actually said, suck on candy, spit on bait, which is kind of gross. But <laughs> it got the kids excited about it. Um, and so making sure that slides is gonna keep your line stronger. The other thing is friction. When you are tying fishing knots, the more the monofilament touches itself, the weaker it can become. So this, this knot actually has less friction. So there's less places at which the line is rubbing against itself, which makes it a stronger knot. Um, again, if you're fishing for pinfish in saltwater or brim uh, and sunfish in freshwater, it's, it, these both are perfectly fine knots to use. So um, and once you get the Palomar knot, if you've gotten it, give us a little heads up on the chat box. Anybody got that one yet? Yeah, well, Sharon and Pat have it. Okay. All right. Going to need a little more practice with this one. <laughs> and, and I tell people too, while you're sitting, oh, good. While you're sitting down in front of the TV, you can get to the point where you're just kind of holding that, practicing it, and doing it without really looking. Because of, of anything that you'll learn, in any webinar on beginning fishing, these are the two things that you need to know. If you go by yourself, if you go take children, um, you're gonna lose rigs and you're gonna lose hooks lots because you're gonna either get tangled up or you're going to, um, if you're in the salt water, you're gonna lose it on oysters. If you're in the fresh water, you're gonna get stuck on a stump. So there's, there's in every, fishing situation, you're going to lose rigs and you're going to lose equipment. So knowing those knots and making sure that you have a strong knot is key. So definitely practice it. And for a long time, if I don't use that, if I don't practice those knots, they get fuzzy and they get, they fade. Now, now they don't, but I, there is a knot that I love to use, but I don't use it very often. So I always have to, like I said, go back to YouTube or or watch a, a video link and, and seeing it animated helps me more than seeing it flat on the screen. So hopefully that's helped everybody. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Um, I'm gonna hang my shark hook back up and we're gonna move on to rigging. So 
like I said, we're gonna we're gonna do a, a basic bobber rig. Um, the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources has some really good information, and um, uh, Shannon will be sending that out as well. Their their page, but they have they have a book that they've produced, and it is a beginner's guide to fishing. They have a saltwater version one too, um, but it has a lot of these knots in here. Um, a lot of basic information, casting, rigging, things like that. But we'll sh but this is what we'll be doing today. So I'm going to show you that basic float rig. And, and we'll talk about why we're doing it that way. Um, okay, so this is the reel that we're going to use. I've already taken the line out. And just so you know, when you push this button right here, and you hold it down, nothing happens. You can't get the line out. When you let go of it, it's gonna free spool out. And to make that stop, you're gonna crank that handle, okay? So cranking the handle makes, well, makes it reel in. So we'll talk about this in casting in a second, but if I need line out, um, I'm going to push that button, pull some line out, and to make it stop, like I said, I'll crank it one time. Um, there we go. So I went ahead and fed my line through, because when you buy this, usually it's not rigged up with equipment, with uh, your hook and your rig and everything on there. So, so you have to rig it. It comes with a little plastic tab, and I thought I had one, but I already cut it off. Um, and it's reeled all the way in. So you can actually push that button and start pulling that line out, and then you're gonna feed it through each of these eyes until you get through the top. And then you're going to tie your hook on. So in this case, this, let me see if you can see that. You see that little hook? That's, this is the size hook that I would use for, say, pinfish um, in the salt water. And like I said, brim or sunfish in the freshwater. Um, I will show you a couple of different types of hooks really quickly before. Um, there are different shapes of hooks, and the one that I have on there is a J hook, and that's kind of a long, straight shank, um, and that's a traditional hook, I, I'd say, that I grew up with, um, and then there's these that look like circle hook. This one's a circle hook, and the way that a circle hook is designed is if, you, if you've ever been fishing and you've caught a fish that swallowed the hook, one of those J hooks will go down into its gut and can get stuck in all kinds of things down there. And then you end up having to cut the line and re-rig and uh, another reason that you would have to know those knots. Um, but with a circle hook, they are designed differently. When, when they put a circle hook in their mouth, um, I was gonna see if I could pull one out. Okay. So, so when the fish comes up and, and takes a circle hook in and swallows it, the way that that point is, you all see that? It's pointed in. So I can pull this out of my hand and it won't catch on me. It won't catch on me at all. So it's not gonna catch on their insides of the fish. So when that fish turns, that's when it's gonna catch in the corner of their mouth. So circle hooks are designed really for catch and release. And that is one of, the, one of the best fishing practices that we can use if you are gonna practice catch and release or if you catch fish that are too small or you catch over the limit and you know you're gonna release fish, circle hooks are great to use. The thing about circle hook is you can't set the hook with it. They have to really set themselves. So if they consume this and you feel it nibble and you set that hook, it's gonna come straight out of their mouth. So you have to know what you have on, your, on the end of your line. If you're fishing with a J hook, you wouldn't want to set that hook. So if you're fishing with a circle hook, you have to wait for that fish to turn and get it caught in its mouth, and then you'll see your rod tip bend, and then you can reel. So different techniques for different types of hooks. Who would have thought that there were so many fishing dilemmas. <laughs> okay, so I've got this little tiny hook on here. I used my, which one did I use? I used the Palomar knot to tie this one on. I had to look and see. Um, again, I've left a tiny 
quarter of an inch um, tag line um, sitting off the edge. But I like to use the smallest hook I can get away with because if I use a big hook, I'm going to show you an example. Um, all right, so here's, here's my fishy family, okay? So if I were going to fish for this guy, I could use this big hook. Can y'all see that one? Okay, so I would, I would use this hook and get him and reel him in. Okay, let's say we get, we get the big one down and we get this guy, okay? Still big enough, I can still catch this one on here. But let's say we get down to this little guy and I still wanna catch a little pinfish. Well, this one's gonna to be too big for him to put in his mouth, okay? So I'm gonna use the smallest hook I can get away with. So I've got this guy. So do you think I can catch this one with this little hook? Yes. Now here's the trick. Can I catch the medium sized one <clears throat> with that little hook? His mouth is sticking out. So the answer is yes, I can catch this one. So what about the big guy? You think I could catch this big guy with this little hook? And again, the answer is yes, if you play it well. So, so you have more opportunity, and I tell people in order to have better success, go with the smallest equipment that you can use to catch what you wanna catch. I, I feel like when you're going fishing in the beginning, it's more about getting some and getting some confidence fishing and landing fish. So I'm gonna use the smallest hook I can because I, I don't mind catching little fish, but I have caught big flounder with a little hook before because you can catch a big fish with a little hook, but you can't catch a little fish with a big hook. Okay, so the first thing we need to put on the end is the hook. The next thing we need to do is use some weight because we want the bait down in the water column where the fish are. They're not floating on the surface. Some fish are completely on the bottom. Some fish are in the water column. Um, and there's lots of ways to tell different aspects of that. But um, what we're gonna use on this particular rig is we're gonna use split shot, okay? This is a removable split shot, okay? On one side, it has this little duck beak and on one side, it has this little Pac-Man. <laughs> um, these are hemostats that I like to use instead of um, flyers. You can use pliers or hemostats. I like these to get fish hooks out of fish's mouths because they're skinny, nice and skinny, you can get them in the mouth. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna squeeze that duck beak side and open the Pac-Man mouth. And then I'm gonna come It looks like BB might be frozen. We will give her another minute to try and get back on our screens. Don't put your fingers in your mouth. Don't put the lead in your mouth. BB, we actually lost you for a minute there. So we, if you wouldn't mind backtracking. Oh, okay. Hmm. Did we, did we, I'm not sure where, where we stopped. So did we, are, did, did everybody see the, the, um split shot yes okay. well i'll do this again so i'm going to squeeze the duck beak side this is like i said this is made out of lead it's a removable split shot um don't put your hands in your mouth don't put your hands in your face when you when you're messing with the lead um but you can buy non-lead versions as well okay so i've got so i've got the string in there that are the monofilament in there and i'm going to close this back I'm gonna use the hemostats, kind of like pliers, and just squeeze it back. This lead is super soft, so it will pinch on very easily. Don't put it in, don't, don't do it with your teeth. I'm telling you, lead is bad news. So, so now that we have, this is as far as we've gotten. So we've got on the end of our line, we've got a hook, and then we've got our split shot. So if I cast out now, then it's going to be on the bottom, okay? So the only thing that I'll be fishing for is whatever lives on the bottom. If I'm in, if I'm on the coast um, and I'm fishing with something on the bottom, 
I'm gonna eat a catch flounder, um, crabs, which will pick your bait off of there. Um, maybe some croaker, things like that. But if you're looking at one of the products from the South Carolina Wildlife, or Department of Natural Resources, I mean, um, so it has this little poster. And if you look at fish, like this, this is a bass, depending on where their mouth's open. If it points downward, they're gonna feed towards the bottom. If it opens in an upward fashion, then they're gonna feed toward the surface. So you can really kind of gauge that. Um, pinfish and brim, sunfish, are usually in the water column a little higher. They're not necessarily on the bottom. So we're going to add something else to this rig, and that would be a float, okay? So we're gonna come up a little higher than this and we're going to add our float. That way we've got our hook, the weight is holding the hook down, and if we put a bobber right here, that'll keep it floating on the surface. So if, you're, um, if, you put it, if you put it on here, then you can adjust the depth. If your bobber is upright like this, then you know it's floating below. If your bobber is laying to the side, that means that um, your, bobber, or your, your bait may be laying on the bottom and you'll need to adjust it. So these bobbers that I'm gonna show you today are also adjustable. And I'm gonna show you a wide range, okay? So this is about an average size that I would normally use. Um, it, it might be a little big, I feel smaller. This is a big bobber that I'm gonna show you and demonstrate with. I would never use this to really fish. Um, <laughs> and then this is a tiny bobber. Um, again, sometimes people will use this in trout streams and things like that, but, and I, I have used these to fish before, but they're just kind of cute. Um, so this is about average size and what I use in my classes. Um, but I'm gonna show you how this, this works. So this, when you put this on your line and the hook is to the bottom, you want the red side on the bottom and the white side on the top, okay? So when you push that button right there, it's gonna expose a hook right there, okay? And then you're gonna hook that on the line and then when you turn it over and it's attached to the line, you're gonna push, you're gonna cover that one so it doesn't come back out. And then you're gonna push the outer edge of that and it'll expose the top hook. I hope you can see that. And then that way it's on there securely, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and hook that on the bottom, okay? And then I'm going to push the outer edge of that and hook that on there. And so that's what your bobber needs to look like. And again, that bobber is gonna be floating on the surface. And if it's upright like that, then your hook is at where it's supposed to be. If it's laying to the side on the surface of the water like that, that means that your hook is on the bottom. So you want it to be hanging upright. Um, if you just depress that just a little bit, you can slide the line through up or down. So you can adjust the depth on there. Um, there are other shapes of those and a lot of people, there are some that you have to put on first, like, like this one, if you're gonna do a rig in salt water maybe that you wanted to, you knew you were gonna have a float and you didn't wanna take it off. The joy with the adjustable ones is you can change the depth on these but you can also take them off. If you decide, you know what, nothing's hitting in the water column, I wanna put it on the bottom, you can just snap that off and not have to re-rig your rod. Um, if you put this one on, you have to slide this one on your line before you tie your hook on. So this one is not really removable unless you cut your rig and start over. So, but it is adjustable up and down depth wise. It has this little stopper that goes in there. So you would slide this on your line, and then put the stopper where you wanted it and then you can adjust it accordingly. Um, this one is similar to that, um, but it is it does have a slice through it and the sticker, 
price tag stickers covering that. Um, but there you go, you can see it. So you can actually add this one onto your line after. So you, again, if you decide, if you're fishing and you decide, I wanna take it off and fish on the bottom, you can do that. Or if you wanna adjust the depth, um, you could do that with this kind. This one is very tight. Okay, there we go. So, that is your basic float rig, okay? Now, I'm gonna reel that in. And then anytime I'm walking or going to from one place to the other just for search for safety i will um hook this on the bracket some some fishing rods have hook uh hook holders down here by the reel but sometimes you just hook it on the the bracket of the eye i don't do it on the eye itself because there's ceramic in there and it might chip it but if you put it on the bracket part it's okay um so this, whenever I walk or I'm going, going from one place to another, like I said, I'll walk with it straight up and down because if it's pointing out, you can run into a tree or someone's ear <laughs> or something like that. So definitely want to be cautious when you're um, moving around with equipment, especially if, you're, if you lay it down to bait up or anything like that. Um, some of the different types of bait you can use when fishing with a float rig. If you're fishing freshwater, you can fish crickets, worms. Um, when, when, you, when I do a cricket, I put, I go behind the head. There's a, a thorax on the cricket. I go behind the head and up through the back and then the cricket still can walk around, can act alive. The point of having live bait is for your bait to still look alive and be alive to attract the fish. And then if you do a worm, I usually uh, some people swear by threading, but I, I've never fished with threaded worms. I always will, will put one on, put it on towards one end of the worm and then loop and then loop so that it's kind of um, jumbled looking on the hook. And that, at that point, you still have, again, the motion, it's wiggling around the hook and it's acting alive, which is great. If you are fishing if, when I fish with this type of rig in salt water, I usually use cut shrimp for that. I don't usually use anything alive on that type of rig in the salt water. And seems, it seems like if you're fishing majority of the time, other than maybe dead winter, shrimp is a very good all around, will catch kind of anything across the board. Um, croaker, whiting, um, spot, penfish, pigfish, oyster toadfish, all kinds of things. So kind of, kind of everything generally likes shrimp out there and it's, it's fun to kind of see how many different things you can catch as well. Um, all right, so the next thing I'm going to talk about, and I can't really do the casting in here, we're going to talk about some casting, but one of the things that I tell people that are beginning, and especially if you don't have a boat or if you're fishing from a public dock or pier, that, that's structure and the fish like structure. They don't necessarily want to be out in the open water. So if you're fishing with little hooks for little fish and you're, you're going to be happy kind of building up that confidence in your fishing, I recommend that you fish straight down where you are. And that is, that is just fish doing what they do, hiding their structure. And all you have to do in that case is if you're going to fish right at, down in front of you, and I've got right here to show you, I've got a casting plug on this. So when we go outside and practice casting, I usually have this casting plug on just for safety so that we don't hit anybody in the head. Um, but if I hold this button, I'm going to hold it behind me so you can see, okay? So I'm gonna hold, hold the button down and nothing happens. But when I let it go, <laughs> it's wrapped around the tip. There we go. I'm gonna try that again. Okay, 
So I'm going to hold the button down. Nothing happens. Let's see a swing. And then I'm going to let it go and it drops. So you just want it to drop straight down in front of you. Again, it's going to be spooling, spooling, spooling until you crank that handle. So once you crank the handle, that locks it into place and it stays right there. I don't know if you can see that that line looks kind of wavy. I like for my line to look a little bit tight. So I don't want my bobber out of the water. I want to give it a little play and watch my bobber, but I don't want, I don't want it like curls in the line because then if you get a nibble, you can't feel that nibble. If you're fishing with a J hook, like what I have on there now, that little straight shank J, then once you feel that nibble, I say start to reel. Um, that, that is, the other thing is keep your, keep your line tight, keep your rod tip up. Those are the two things once you get started and you get it in the water to remember. And if you're fishing with that J hook, keep, just start reeling when you feel that nibble. Okay, so if I were to cast, and I'm gonna just talk about that casting because I can't do that because I'm inside. Um, I'm going to hold the button down. I'm gonna push it down and hold it tight so that nothing happens. Um, I'm gonna make sure I'm in a space that's big enough that I can make my safety circle. I can spin around the circle and not hit anything or anybody. And I'm gonna always check over my shoulder. Always check over your shoulder. I've gotten it in the nose, I've gotten it in the arm, I've gotten it in the ear. And people, even, even adults that for just forget that one little step, just always check over your shoulder. And you could be in a place where you don't think anybody is or that anything could be behind you and something can happen. So always check over your shoulder. I like to do it nice and slowly to where I, I, don't, I don't whip it, but I bring it, I push that button down and I'll bring it, as I look over my shoulder, I will bring the rod back as over my shoulder. That way I can watch it the whole time and I make sure it doesn't get looped around the tip. Because as you just saw, if it gets looped around the tip while you're, on your back cast, then it won't go anywhere when you front cast. So I brought it back behind me and I see it's dangling and not tangled. So I'm, when I go in the front, I'm going to bring it over my, over my head. And then when I get to where I would release a baseball, like if I was throwing a baseball, um, I would release that button right where I would release the ball. And that's it's going to cast out in front of me. The way you can tell if it cast if you let go too early is it's going to go straight up over your head. If you let go too late, it's going to go right down on the ground in front of you. So it takes a little practice. And again, I if you talk to my sister, she'll tell you I'm a terrible caster. Uh, well, aimer, I guess. <laughs> and so I have to spend time tar practicing at Target. So find a bucket, find a hula hoop, um, find something in the yard, get, get one of these casting plugs. Some people have a piece of garden hose that they just, like an old garden hose they'll cut up, something. You can find something to do to catch or to, to use as a target. I actually have these that I use in my classes. These are called backyard bass. And I will set these out. And as you cast over it, um, the, the casting plug will hook in there and you'll actually get to catch a fish. So that's one of those things that I use to, to help with the aim and to help folks understand that control. Because sometimes you're casting around trees or rocks or docks or whatever that might be. All right. Any questions so far? Has anybody put anything in the chat box that I'm going too fast, I'm going too slow? We haven't had any questions in the chat box, but don't forget you can ask your questions and I'll jump in and ask them of BB. We do have about nine minutes left. I know we started a little bit late, um, but I'll keep watching that chat box for you. Okay, good. Well, so that is a, that's a, most of everything you need to know to really get started um, with the basic fishing and, and knot tying. Now, I'm gonna talk to you a tiny bit about some resources that we have. Um, I mentioned that we catch lots of different species and lots of different 
types of fish. And um, so one of the things that I work with at the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council is an app called My Fish Count. And that is a, a free app you can use on your phone. And from, from day one, I've talked, I've taught people to use a log or a diary to, to record what you're doing and remember what the conditions were when you went fishing, um, what, what the tide was if you were on the coast, what the, what, like I said, what the weather conditions were, what the moon phase was, things like that for you to remember so that you could replicate that later. This allows you to, to track that electronically. So you put that on your phone. Um, not only are you able to have your own personal logbook, 24 hours after you enter that trip, it puts a weather stamp on it. So it gives you all that information. So it'll say, when you caught that um, sp spotted sea trout, it was high tide, you know, full moon, wind was 15 miles out of the north or whatever. It tells you everything you need to know about that, that the weather on that trip. Um, you can log as much or as little detail information on your catches, but it's, it's really a logbook for you to use. In addition to, it provides information for fishery managers. So it's great. It works in the South Atlantic region. So North Carolina down to the tip of the key, or actually North Carolina all the way through Florida. And um, so I encourage you to check that out. It's a free download. And if you do it today, um, you'll be able to get a free three month subscription to Saltwater Sportsman Magazine. But today is our last day. Um, so check that out. Also, if you are going to go fishing, this is last year, so I apologize. Make sure you have an updated copy. But DNR puts out the rules and regulations. It has size limits and bag limits and what you need to know to get your license. You can buy it online. You can buy it at a tackle shop. Uh, the age at which you need a license in South Carolina, and most states, but not all, is 16. So um, make sure you have that if you're going to fish in any public waters. And um, yeah, any, anybody else have any questions? We do have a couple questions. So Bill okay. says, on the improved clinch knot, any advantage to twisting more than six times? So it's, it's really kind of a, a general feel. I, like I said, I use, when I, monofilament has different pound test. And it's so a different weight and diameter to the line. So if you're fishing like a tiny, like for tiny trout in the trout streams of North Carolina, you've got super like hair thin line and you don't have to do it that many times. Or, or I'm sorry, you do have to do it because that's so thin. I like to do it. I may do it maybe eight or 10 times with that super fine. Um, then if I'm fishing offshore for something big, um, you, it's, it's so hard to do it that many times. So you'll do it maybe four or five times. So it really is a general rule of thumb and it, what you're comfortable with. I've had people swear they're like seven, seven is the number. Um, <laughs> so it's really personal preference at this point. The, the, the entry level like things for all around fishing are eight or 10 or 12 pound test. I think anywhere from five to eight is, is fine. You're, you, get, you get to choose. <laughs> yeah, Kendall, you'll have to give, us, give that a try and let us know what works best for you. Um, we have a funny question from Jay. He wants to know, is there any truth if you hold your mouth open a certain way, you'll catch more fish? I am gonna, I'm a big believer in signs and I, <laughs> I'm gonna go out on a limb and say yes. Um, my, my dad always said you gotta hold your mouth right and I actually told that to my child that was um I, I had taken him out of school early one day and took him fishing and and he did the whole thing with his tongue sticking out and right when he did he hooked the fish and so he has preached that since then <laughs> Now, I don't think we'll have time to really go into detail with this question but Alice wants to know how do you clean a fish Oh, okay. So again, I, there's different ways for different fish and um, that would be a great thing to come to our women's outdoor retreat. So the South Carolina Wildlife Federation, um, and Shannon mentioned this earlier, I'm an instructor for that. I'm not the fishing instructor, well, saltwater sometimes, but, um, but they, there's a great fellow that comes and teaches that at the women's outdoor retreat. So we invite you to kind of keep an eye out for that. Unfortunately, 
uh, due to what's going on this year, we had to, to cancel that, which I felt weird the other day because I was like, I know I'm supposed to be there. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a really good event to help you introduce you to lots of different aspects of being in outdoors. And that's one of them. And I tell you, I went and learned how to clean a catfish because I had never skinned a catfish or, or done anything like that. I've always cleaned saltwater fish. So scaling, you know, some of the fish you scale and he was showing you how to do it with a spoon. And so there's lots of different techniques. Um, again, you can watch some of those online, but I really recommend coming to an event like the Women's Outdoor Retreat and getting that hands-on experience. It's, it's really great. You get so much out of it because you're actually participating in doing it instead of just watching somebody do it. So it's great. That's true. I did the uh, learn how to clean a fish class last year and you also got to learn how to cook that fish once it was cleaned and it was quite a tasty experience. It, it is, it is. It looks like right now those are all the questions that we have. Um, the only other where do you like to go fishing? Where are you going to go fishing this upcoming weekend? Well, okay, so I've got some plans right now. Um, on the coast, there's big bull redfish. So, uh, redfish, red drum, and South Carolina have a slot limit, which means you can't keep them be uh, below a certain size or above a certain size. So, within the slot, you can keep them. Well, personally, I don't keep any redfish so it doesn't really matter to me but I do enjoy catching them so the the big big ones are called bull reds and they are uh, running right now a lot of people are catching those so I have two um, trips coming up one in Charleston Harbor and one in Beaufort and I can tell you my secret spot but it's safe and hidden <laughs> on the my fish count app <laughs> Sounds like everyone's going to need to download it. Alex <laughs> popped in with one more question. Uh, what is the best tide for trout fishing? Or, uh, tide, you said? Yes. Okay. See, I'm giving away my secrets here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I like to fish an incoming tide. Um, once, it, once it gets in a little ways, you don't want to, I don't like to fish dead low and I don't like to fish dead high. I like to fish that incoming tide where they're coming in to feed. All the little bait fish are up hiding in the grass. They're coming in towards the grass and then you fish that grass line. Um, once the tide starts to fall, you know, they're kind of full. So, <laughs> so that's my theory is I like to fish on that incoming tide. Um, creek mouths, pull it across the creek mouth and, and that's where they're chasing the bait fish. Very good. That's, that's it for questions right now. Anything else to add, BB? The only other thing I was going to mention, and one of the things that kind of also got me into this path of going, of doing fishing education and things, was Camp Wildwood. And um, as, a, as a camper, I started going to Camp Wildwood when I was 13 years old. It's the first time I'd ever heard about the South Carolina Wildlife Federation. So the, the Wildlife Federation, DNR, and the Garden Club sponsor this camp that it is for students who have finished ninth grade through the 12th. And it's a wonderful week up at Kings Mountain State Park. And they learn all, all kinds of stuff, get exposed to things in the outdoors. It's uh, wildlife, fisheries, hunter education. Um, it, it's a forestry. It's a great way to kind of um, explore some career ideas. And in addition to, to learning some leadership skills and learning more about the outdoors. So, uh, I think we'll have that in the link as well. So if you have a, a student that is that age, definitely give that a look. I work with a second year program still, and uh, it, it's, it's part of who I am, so I love it. Amazing, thank you so much, BB. Um, I will be sending a recap email. Um, if you're watching this video on YouTube after we've uploaded it and this class is no longer live, um, we'll have those links down at the bottom of the video, so click down there. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for coming. BB, thank you so much for hosting this class. Um, I did want to add, if you haven't checked out our list of upcoming webinars, we do have a few more scheduled for October. Uh, we'll be adding a couple more for November before the end of the year. Um, and then, of course, if you aren't a supporter of the South Carolina Wildlife Federation, I'll also include a link with some information about how you can become a supporter of us as well. We've been trying really hard to keep these classes free. Um, thank you again to um, 
the Cabela's Outdoor Fund um, for making that happen for us today. We're so thankful to have them as um, sponsors. Um, but we would love to have you join the Wildlife Federation and we really appreciate Bibi for her time. Thanks everybody. Follow up, find me on social media if you have any questions. All right, I'll send those um, angling women links out as well. Thank you. Bye.